With Heart Rhythm TV from Denver, Colorado, I'm Dan Aliash, again with the Ice Image of the Month. Uh, welcome. Again, we are joined by Dr. Pasquale Santangeli of the Hospital University of Pennsylvania. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel, for the kind invite. Happy to be here again. So, you know, we're, we're again focusing on the posterior superior process. This is episode two. Uh, the first episode focused on understanding the anatomy and uh, ablating arrhythmias coming from this region. This episode will now focus on uh, the gerbode or an iatrogenic gerbode uh, or the trans right atrial to left ventricle puncture for double mechanical valves NVT uh, that Dr. Santangeli is pioneering. Um, so I'll start off with our first question here. Um, this is the dedicated ice view with the sheath. Will you describe for our viewers what they're seeing related to the McAl uh, McAlpine image, and then also describe how you get all these catheters in place and how you obtain this view. Thank you, Daniel. I think this is quite crucial here because if you remember the prior episode that we discussed, uh, the view that we obtained always had the non-coronary cusp in view. And that was really obtained simply by advancing the catheter in the mid red atrium and clocking it, having the coronary sinus in the far field and countering slightly. And that way you see the inferior septal process or posterior superior process of the left ventricle. The problem with that view is that whenever you have the coronary cusp in view, we will also have the mechanical valve in view when you have a patient with double mechanical valve. So we have to modify that in such a way that we uh, got the mechanical valves out of the picture in order to visualize uh, that near field inferior septal process of the ventricle clearly, like you're seeing here. So with a lot of manipulation and uh, trial by error, really, uh, we ended up uh, finding this specific view, which works all of the times, actually. And the eyes is really uh, basically uh, positioned in the inferolateral aspect of the uh, RV inflow, right at the level of the tricuspid valve, basically. And you can see on the right side, there is an anatomical picture of where the ice probe is positioned. And this actually is really easily uh, obtainable by uh, anterior tilt of the eyes, basically you lock the eyes in the middle, in the, in the mid right atrium and do anterior tilt and rightward rotation usually. And you keep the catheter in that position. By doing that, typically you end up with a, a modified long axis view. Uh, actually, I call this a modified, uh, basically five chamber view or four chamber view. Usually it's four to five, and I'll talk to you later why. Uh, where you will see the right atrium on the top here, some of the septal leaflet of the tricuspid annulus, part of the right ventricle, the left ventricular chamber in the long axis, which is quite important when you advance a wire, you wanna see it coming through and the most inferior aspect of the inferior septal process of the left ventricle. Inferior means is inferior to the aortic valve, which, is, which you cannot see here on this view. And it's also slightly anterior to the mitral valve, which you also don't see here. Rarely, uh, close to the sheath here, that you can see the distenting in this area, uh, you will see also the coronary sinus. That's why occasionally you end up with a five chamber type of view. But here you can see basically from this view, and again, uh, and the reason why the apex is pointing to the left side is because we flip the eyes the other way around to replicate what we see on TTE. And we discussed about that in the prior episode. But basically you see the deflectable sheet that is stenting the radial aspect of the inferior septal process of the left ventricle. So it's within the red atrium towards the left ventricle. And this typically is achieved with a large collagenous bend in that area. Great. Um, so we'll move on to our next image here. Um, so again, I see that um, you have your deflectible sheath in this region and you're using your fluoros fluoroscopic view here to help. Talk a little bit about how much fluoro you use, how much ice you use and how they complement each other. Yeah, so the positioning of the sheath in that specific, in that specific location is entirely guided by ice uh, because there is a lot of variability in between patients and also because there is really no fluoroscopic marker that is reliable enough to understand where the sheet would be uh, in comparison with the, with the inferior septal process of the, of, the, of the left ventricle. So once you position a sheet there, but the reason why I put the floor on the other side is just to show the position of the intracardiac echo, which is parallel to the sheet, but is more lateral in the LAO projection. Really, uh, it's basically facing the specific area, but more lateral to it, so give you a little bit more room to see the sheet. So in terms of fluoroscopy, really, we don't use it much uh, to position the sheet, but we will use it to, to, to get access and to verify balloon inflation, et cetera, which will be the next step. But really, the position of the sheet is entirely guided by eyes. So my other question for you is, 
is it possible or have you done it without fluoroscopy? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it is possible. However, I don't want to, um, uh, we don't want to injure, uh, we don't want to get tangled against the mechanical valves in uh, any ways, really. So advancing a wire, a long wire without fluoroscopy is possible, as long as you know exactly what the wire tip will be. And sometimes it's not that easy to visualize within yeah. the left ventricle, I have to say. So uh, I like to use fluoroscopy for this. It's not that much fluoroscopy, but it's some fluoroscopy. Okay, so we'll go to the next uh, slide um, here to discuss what you're describing, which is this, the RF power wire, which you use, um, and then advancing the wire into the uh, left ventricle. So I'll let you talk about the uh, usage of this wire, what you're looking at, and also how you like to apply this wire. Yeah, this is actually a wire that was initially designed for uh, um, crossing uh, chronic total obstructions of the veins or arteries. And basically is a relatively stiff wire that is insulated all the way to the tip and it can deliver radio frequency to perforate. Um, this wire is actually uh, owned by Bayless. And uh, uh, the reason why I like to use a straight wire is because the uh, path that we have to cross is really, it can be variable and can be set, uh, relatively long. If you do use a J wire, then it's gonna create a J as soon as it crosses the first few millimeters. So you won't be able to push it through the myocardium. So it's always easier to use a straight wire for this. Uh, in one case, uh, before we had the availability of this wire, we even ended up using the back end of the Agilis uh, wire that comes with Agilis, something that I don't recommend doing because we have an FDA approved tool that is the RF power wire, but it works exactly the same way because you can apply it as electrocautery from that wire. It's a stiff end of it. This one, of course, is better where, for different reasons. Uh, so I would recommend to use this one for the axis. So once it's there, you see that the wire goes straight through the Agilis and we actually puncture in the, uh, the area. And you can actually validate access, not only on fluoroscopy by seeing the wire going to the apex, but also nice as you're gonna see micro bubbles as soon as you apply radio frequency and cross uh, the interoceptor process of the left, left ventricle. Uh, just one quick thing, eyes is quite important to understand the angle because you don't wanna be too slanted in that area. You really wanna be as perpendicular as possible because the path that the wire will have to cross and therefore your balloon and finally the sheet it's really uh, is the shortest one, and you want to have the shortest amount of uh, you don't myocardium on the way. Angle through the tissue at all. You want it to be as perpendicular as possible. And then, can you comment also on how roughly how thick is this region typically? Yeah, whenever we measure it, it's anywhere in between uh, five millimeters and up to ten millimeters on average. So it's really not too thick, but uh, on average, I would say it was five millimeters measured on ice, and is the is very uh, uh, is not that thick comparing to the rest uh, of the left ventricle. The very first cases we've done were, were really in, in muscular septum, and those are very thick regions, and it takes a lot of effort to go through. Here, doesn't take too much. So the next step you describe is the balloon dilation of the septum. Will you walk us through it and in, 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 uh, on ice and as well as fluoroscopy? Yes. Yeah, so uh, again, this was uh, something that we found out after we tried sometimes for several hours, the first, uh, the first case is to cross with a dilator over the wire, it never worked. So that was a bailout initially and it became our standard approach afterwards. So the reason why uh, dilation doesn't work really with dilator because the angle is too perpendicular. You can't transmit the force in that, in that direction. So here we are loading a balloon that is used for peripheral interventions and for an agilis sheet, uh, usually we go with a six to eight millimeter diameter balloon. The reason why we use a larger balloon than the sheet because there's a lot of elastic recoil in that area. So we just basically, the technique is quite simple. We inflate the balloon, we make sure that the septum dilates. Then we quickly deflate the balloon and we advance the sheet over the balloon using the balloon as a dilator basically uh, to go through it. And uh, that was the uh, best way for us to cross uh, with, uh, uh, and now we can do this within really 20 minutes. Uh, as opposed to try with validation, which usually doesn't work. Very nice. And I think we'll close here with this. You know, at the end of the procedure, you you um, you reveal an, an iatrogenic resi residual small defect. Um, how frequently does this persist? How quickly does it close? Yeah, great question. Uh, some of this is still uh, under investigation. I would say how long, because we have uh, one patient that. Uh, recently we've done it, we didn't close within a month. All the patients that we published before that were able with this uh, residual reported defect was really uh, non-visual, non we couldn't see it to the next day. But here, the interesting thing is that right after the procedure, we're pulling back the sheet and you're actually doing color in this area. You can see that it's flow. 
between the left ventricle and the, and the right atrium. When you do measure, though, the size of the uh, shunt with a vena contracta, for example, it tended to be four to five millimeters on average, which is much smaller than the diameter of the sheath or way smaller than the diameter of the balloon that we used. So I do believe there is a fair amount of elastic recall of the set of fibers there that tends to close. Uh, in one patient, uh, in all these patients, we were not able to visualize it the day after. In one patient, which we done more recently, it was still there, but the flow was the flow rate, the velocity was extremely high, suggesting really uh, a, a very small uh, residual defect with no significant hemodynamic consequence. None of these patients had our failure over uh, follow-up, and we follow-up now extended up to uh, more than 1.5 years, so about one year and a half for that. Uh, and uh, interestingly, none of these patients had a uh, heart block either acutely or doing follow-up following the procedure. So, well, well, thank you very much. Really, really great discussion. You know, I guess I, I can't help but ask, you know, uh, we've all seen, you know, 3D eyes coming online and, you know, its application to ablation. What, what, if any, do you see any application for 3D eyes moving forward with this technique? Yes, I think it may potentially help us to minimize even further the use of fluoroscopy for some of these steps. Uh, in particular, uh, sometimes it's difficult to understand uh, how much a balloon is dilating, how much the waste of the balloon uh, is being created, and also for crossing with the wire. I have to say that uh, I haven't used 3D eyes yet uh, in any application, so I still am looking forward to understand how much we led to 2D eyes, which is already quite awesome in terms of the uh, capability that we have during the procedure. But definitely for these more complex interventions and structural interventions in general, 3D eyes may offer something more than regular 2D eyes. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Santangeli. Uh, ice is truth. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us and we look forward to further collaborations. Thank you again for having me again. And uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor.